so that you understand how horrible that is. We tried our best. Miss Bridget has painted. I think Miss Drina made all of the, 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 uh, the labels and stuff so that you can kind of see it. This is just a picture that doesn't really do it justice, but it talks about here this leather thong or this whip that was made, bits of bone and bits of pottery and bits of, bo of, of uh, clay and things that are in here, metal balls used to inflict pain upon the victim. Oftentimes, as a matter of fact, studying historians back in this time, these Roman legionnaires were the biggest, the baddest, the meanest, and the strongest, and usually the drunkest. And their job was to do what they could to try to kill the victim, the victim by blood loss. Oftentimes, when they struck the victim the first time or two, the blood would immediately begin to pool underneath the skin, and it would begin to create contusions, and then begin to create a demon, and it would begin to create uh, different things where there was blood and fluids up underneath it. And then once they finally broke through that flesh, then it would burst through into huge pools of blood and oftentimes the individuals would wind up dying from simply blood loss alone. By this time, Jesus Christ has already been to a trial. By this time, he had been tried at night time. He has already been beaten. He has already been spat upon. They've already made fun of him by putting a little reed in his hand and then taking something similar to a bamboo rod, plaiting a crown of thorns, placing it upon his head, and then banging that crown of thorns down into his head. And he was already bleeding profusely. He had not had anything to drink. He was dehydrated. He was emaciated. He had been up all night long. He had had the last supper there with the apostles and then gone out into the garden. And after that was taken through this sham of a trial. By this time, he stands before Pilate. And Pilate says, well, I can't find any fault with him. And they say, well, give us Barabbas and go ahead. So Pilate's thought was, if I have him beaten bad enough, if that doesn't kill him, when they see him beaten, you know what they'll say? That's enough. That, then let him not be crucified. You say, why? Pilate was an instrument in the hands of, G, of the devil himself because the devil did not want him to go to Calvary. You see, this portion of the atonement wouldn't have been enough to complete the atonement for your soul. This portion of him starting to shed his blood for the things that you've done and did, that is not going to cover everything. The Bible says, by his stripes you're healed. Every stripe you see right there would cover every sin you could possibly commit. As a matter of fact, if you look at the body of Jesus Christ, you'll see holes in his hands, which we'll talk about in a little while. What are those there for? They're for sins of things you touched you shouldn't have touched. What about the holes in his feet for going places you had no business going? What about the crown of thorns around his head? That's for my sins of intellect, my thinking things that are not right to think. What about the hole that's over in his side that ran up in his heart? That's for my sins of affection. Every sin you could possibly account for, he died for, and he paid the price as he was laying there and being whipped. The devil is right here, make no mistake. If I could get this painted the way I'd like, I would have Miss Bridget paint a picture of Satan on carnet over here. I'd have that sulfuric breath right in the face of Jesus Christ and saying, you're going to let your creation do this to you? You're going to let these people that are going to deny you and betray you anyway do this to you. You're going to die for these people who've never done anything good for you. These people that have spat on you and plucked out your beard and mocked you, belittled you, made fun of you. After all you've done for them, you're going to let them do this. People in that crowd were not just individuals. They were his chosen people, the nation of Israel, the Jews. And sometimes even in churches you have individuals that happen to be against each other and Jesus Christ knows exactly what that's like. That beating was something beyond whatever you could imagine. Those individuals that were there were not only physically strong, but they would have been demonically possessed. The t the tri what the Lord is trying to do here is, is pour out his wrath upon sin and the devil is doing everything he can to try to kill him, but he left out one variable. He can't kill eternal life. The reason that Jesus Christ didn't die when he was being beaten there as anybody else would is because when he decides when he dies, because the Bible said he laid his life down. It was a willing sacrifice. Make no mistake about it. The Romans, the Jews, and me and you did not take his life from him. He gave his life for you and I. Every beating that he took there, he took willingly. The Bible says when he reviled, he reviled not again. When they mocked the little, they made fun of him. They said certain things. They smacked him. You know what the Lord said? If I've said anything worthy of being smacked, then go ahead and smack me. Contrary to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 2, when they smacked him, Paul said, The Lord smite thee, you whited wall. The difference is, as a lamb for a sheep before a shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. 
Boy, what a lesson there is in that. When he's being accused, and it would have to all be false, when he's being accused by the people he knows, Caiaphas smacks him. They got his eyes blindfolded. They're laughing at him. It's in a sense that like him being tortured by a terrorist organization, like they've got a bag over his head. And they walk up and smack him, and they mock him and say, well, who smacks you? And the Lord said, well, I'll tell you when it really matters. I'll see you at the great white throne. I'll tell you who smacks me. He knew exactly who was hitting them before they ever hit him. He knew exactly what was going on. You know what he did? He sat there and willingly take it. Picked himself up off the floor time and time and time and time again. They put on him a purple robe. Why? To mock him because he was a king. To laugh at him, to belittle him, to make fun of him. You say, well, I don't know that I would do that. We similarly do the same thing when you mock his crucifixion. If you don't accept the blood atonement, guess what? God's not in love with you like you might think. If you're visiting today, could I just say this to you with all the compassion I can muster? Uh, the mistake is that the world has taught you that God loves you even if you're unsaved. God doesn't love you if you haven't trusted His Son. Amen. The love comes in Jesus Christ. The key to getting God's love is to be in Jesus Christ, the one that bought and paid for you. Amen. Well, after they have beaten Him, they bring Him out there. Pilate makes a great statement and it'd make a great sermon. If you had time to preach the sermon, a message I heard preached years ago and I've never forgotten is called, Behold the Man. And in that message called Behold the Man, Pilate has brought him out there. The Bible says in Isaiah 52, his visage was marred more than any man. He comes out there looking like hamburger. His mother wouldn't even recognize him. He didn't know who it was or maybe to hear him speak. I mean, beaten up without a bone broken. Beaten beyond any kind of recognition whatsoever. Eyes now swollen shut, mouth all drawn together. The Bible says in Psalm 22 that his mouth is dried out and it's like postured. And all that pus, all that sweat, all of those things are beginning to come out of him. And he brings him up there naked from the waist down, most likely completely naked. And he presents him to the crowd and he says, Behold the man! And the crowd's response is, Yes, so what? Crucify him. Bloodlust had run about them. They're so thirsty they can't wait to see him crucified. They can't stand it. And so now what Pilate does is he condemns him to be crucified and he lets Barabbas go free. I wanted to get the boys to sing it today, but we don't have time. I want to be respectful of your time, but I wanted them to sing that song that, uh, about Barabbas going free. You say, why? Because that would be me in the story. I'm the one that was condemned to death. I'm the one that deserved to die. I'm the one that did things guilty of dying. I'm guilty of deicide. I deserve to pay for my sin in hell. And the Lord came up there and said, which one do you want? And the Lord said, wait a minute. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll die in his place and I'll let him go free. I'm Barabbas in the story. Uh, a, 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 a rebel. I'm an individual that didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. I'm out my, about my own causes. I might have looked at him and said he must be a good man, but if it push comes to shove, you're going to crucify me or him? Crucify him. Let him go. You know what you'll do? You'll make the same decision today. You'll walk out of here today. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you know what you'll say? I don't care he died for everybody else. He ain't dying for me. Let me go. You know what you have to do in order to be saved? You have to let him take your place. But you have to realize you deserve to be there. The fellow said one time to me, he said, you know, well, so what you're saying is if I was the only man around, then Jesus would have died for me. And I said, yep. But I said, that's only half the story. You say, why is that? Because the other half is, is you'd have been the one to put him on the cross. If you really want to know how that really goes, it goes like this. You'd have been the one whipping him. You'd have been the one nailing the nails on him. You'd have been the one spitting on him. You'd have been the one plucking his beard. You'd have been the one taking the one that created you. You say it can't be that way. If you're unsaved today, you're guilty of deicide. You did do that. If you're saved today, you took responsibility for doing that, and you realize that you are the one that did that. I wish I could paint. I can't paint. If I could paint, man, I would have this old soldier down here, and I'd have him turn his head just, to, just enough, and you'd see a profile of my face with gritted teeth and a devilish look on my face. If I could paint when we get over here to the spikes, I'd have that Roman centurion there with that big hammer in his hand like this. And right as he's driving that spike into the hand of Jesus Christ, I'd have him turn around and look with that most demonic grimace on his face. But you could tell it was me. And I'd be driving that spike down into his hands and into his feet. I'd hang him up there on that cross. I'd be the one standing there with that spear and jab it in his side with my teeth gritted and said, yeah, it's about time you die. And jab it and watch that blood and water flow down, run all down on the spear and run all over me. And me just wash that stuff off of me and say, I don't want nothing to do with that. It's just another person. That's how I'd paint it. You say, why? That's how you have to apply the atonement. You have to realize it's not for the whole world. It's for you personally. 
you have to apply it personally. And if you don't apply it personally, you can't be saved. So the next thing that they do is, is they take the cross member. Now many times they show it different kinds of ways that generally would lash the person to the cross. Sometimes they carry it on their shoulders. Sometimes they carry it across their backs and those kind of things. And so he would have carried it. People want to disagree with this. If you study crosses and how things were made, going all the way to Vlad the Impaler and all the other kind of things they picked up from Rome, it makes more sense that they had a standard that would be anywhere from six to eight feet up in the air so they'd be able to lift the victim up there and then slide this cross member over there. It had a little biscuit cut or a dovetail cut in it, and it would slide over and fall into place and jar the victim's hands, which we'll talk about in a minute, that were nailed here. That would also make the cross member to be reused, and they would leave the standard all along the highway to remind all of the Jews who was in power in time, to let them know there was capital punishment for not going along with Rome. If you disagreed with the government in those days, they crucified you. Most likely, and I'll get to this with the feet in a minute, most likely this part right here is called a sedile, was most likely not there. Most of the crosses that they've dug back up didn't have that. And the reason for that is, is that by nailing the foot with the ankle with the heel all the way this way, the victim would be unable to lock his legs and take pressure off. It would keep pressure constantly on his thighs until his thighs would begin to tremble and begin to shake, and then he would drop, and then the weight would be on both of his arms. And that weight is spread out evenly because they became real, real good instruments of torture. Now this says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It's written in all the languages. You know, what you've got to look in here is, is when it says this is king of the Jews, uh, you have a, one thief over there that believes what he read. And you have another one that didn't believe what he read. He thought he was just a man. And they are getting ready to try to execute this man, and they want to try to get it done as quickly as they possibly can. Now, the spike is generally about like this, probably around four inches or so long, that kind of a deal, or five to seven inches long, excuse me, and about four inches or, or 0.4 inches in diameter. It's a good sized spike. You say, why? It's not a 10 penny nail. You've got to hold somebody up there. Plus it has to have a head on it big enough that when the individual goes into convulsions or what some people would call seizures, they would get so violent that they would literally pull themselves off the cross. You say, how is that possible? The violence slamming back and forth of the body against the cross eventually works the hole out between the hand here, which I'll show you in a second, and they wind up pulling themselves up. That's why oftentimes you see pictures with ropes on them. The ropes weren't to hold them up on the cross, it was to hold them to the cross. So that when they went into convulsions, as many of them did, when the blood loss and all, and the loss of oxygen and the capillaries began to shut down the blood flow, and then the oxygen, the little tiny oxygen bubbles began to die off one by one, and carbon monoxide begins to build, not carbon dioxide, monoxide, and they begin to die off real slow. And convulsions begin to happen, seizures begin to happen, and they become to get real, real violent. They drive it in between the hand here. They say, well, it was in the hands. It was in the hands. In those days, they shook hands this way. Two reasons. Number one, that would have meant Thomas put his hand in the nail print of Jesus Christ. And number two, they would run their hand underneath somebody else's tunic to make sure they didn't have a knife on them. That was one of the ways of ensuring that there was something there. When they shook hands, they embraced this way. So Thomas would have put his hand right in the nail print of Jesus Christ without any problem whatsoever. Not only that, they'll tell you that they can't drive a spike that big in your hand without breaking a bone, number one. And number two, if they could, the flesh won't hold more than about 40 to 60 pounds depending upon how strong the flesh is. They know that when they hang an individual on the cross between this stipend that's across here, across the top of this, they know that the weight is going to bear out exactly the same. If it happens to be a 100-pound man, there will be somewhere in excess of about 72 pounds on this hand and 72 pounds on this hand. You might think that it would be maybe 35 and 35. The way they have it, the way they learned to hang them on this cross here, they made sure that the weight was borne equally by both hands. There's a lot of good preaching in that. But the weight was borne there for the purpose of one thing only, putting so much pressure on the median nerve that it caused excruciating pain beyond anything you can imagine. The median nerve runs right up between that and gets clipped over here when they drive the nail through here. 